Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to gather together as your people. I pray that you would speak to us through your word now. We pray your spirit would open our hearts and minds so we'd understand. Uh, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The church has left the building. This is, uh, yeah, this is my first time around on this. Uh, so I, I love it. I, I love that we are going to leave this building and go out into the community. Now, I know every, not everyone can participate or will participate today, but a lot of us will uh, be going out of the walls of this building to the community to serve uh, because it reminds us that the church is not the building. And we often use that in our language. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to church today. I'm going to go to, and we, we mean the building. Well, we don't have to say that, and I'm not saying we should. I'm going to go to the church building, um, but the reality is the church is not the building. The church is the people. The church is the people of God. In fact, there are many people all around the world today that are the church, being the church, living out as the church that don't have a building. Uh, maybe they're living in poverty. They, they have to meet in secret. They're still the church, but they don't have a building. Uh, so this, what this event does is it reminds us that the church is not the building, that we are the church, and that we are to be the church as we go out into the world. But why? Why do we do the church has left the building? Why do we do this every year? Uh, that's a good question. And I want to invite uh, the team, the leadership team for the church has left the building. So Kathy Heinzelman, uh, Rick Gregory, Randy and Don Reeder, uh, Sharon Second and Maggie Matisic. Why don't you come on up? Come on up on stage. I'm going to have you help me with something here. First of all, let's just thank them for the work they've done to put this together. This is, this was, uh, I know they were meeting many, many hours, hours upon hours to put all this together, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, but as you're on stage, I want to put you on the spot for a minute, okay? Because here's, because I'm new, and I've never done this before. No, you're first. Uh, because I've never done this before, I'm thinking, okay, so we're going to go out into the community, we're going to serve in different areas, and there will, may be people who will, who will ask, why are you doing this? <laughs> They're going to ask, why are you doing this? Why are you here? Why are you serving? So if, this is a good question, right? Uh, how would you answer that question? So now you get to start because you're the leader, but we're going to pass it on down, and I'm going to say, so if someone comes to you and says, today, if you're out and you're serving... Uh, why are you doing this? What will you say? Um, what I would say was we saw a need, and we followed God's lead to meet that need. And we are excited to help today and to come alongside you. Good. All right. Rick, what would you say? I would say that we are followers of Jesus, and we're following Jesus out into the world to, to help in areas that we see that there's a need to be his hands and feet. Thanks. I would say that God loves everyone, and we need to provide for them through, through his word. Um, I would just echo what Rick said, that um, we are God's hands and feet, and this is the way that we show God's love to our community. That church is more than just Sunday morning, but that we want to connect with the people out in the community. And my experience has been they're always surprised that, th that we would give up time to come out and serve them. I would say that it's not always what we say, but what we also do. We could show it through doing things yeah, also. Good. Good. All right, give them a hand. Thank you. you can. All right. Thank you. I, they were not prepared for that question. <laughs> I did not give them a heads up. So that was real. All right. That's, that was their answer. So now I'm going to put it to you. I'm not going to hand the microphone around this, this auditorium. But if I were to ask you or if someone were to ask you today, why are you doing this? What would you say? What would you say? What would be your answer? I hope you wouldn't say, because I'm such a good person. Or, uh, because my parents are making me. <laughs> or, so I can get to heaven. That would be a bad answer. Don't, don't answer that way. Um, 
But uh, some of the answers that we heard uh, the team uh, were excellent uh, to, to show the love of Jesus. That's, I mean, Jesus loved me, and I want to show love, that same love to you. God has been so good to me in Christ. I want to serve him. And by serving, him, I, by serving you, I'm serving him. Uh, that's what we're doing. That's why we are doing this. Uh, acts of service done by Christians should be an overflow of our gratitude for God's mercy. And we're going to see that today as we open God's word. So if you have a copy of God's word, why don't you open it to Romans chapter 12. We've, we heard it earlier in the, uh, as we were singing together, but Romans 12, we're going to look at this text, just two verses. You're thinking, this is going to be a really short sermon. No. <laughs> no, it's not. Good try, though. Good try. Uh, Romans 12. Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2. If you, brought, if you grabbed one of those hardback copies on the cart in the lobby, uh, it's page 947. We're going to dig into this text a little bit this morning. We're going to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. And here, these two verses are going to help us answer two important questions. Here's the first question. Why we serve? Why we serve? This is why we serve. Look at the beginning of verse 1. We're going to see it in a moment. Actually, I want to first illustrate the importance of this question. Because foundations are important. Uh, the, there's a duplex being built just down the street from our house. And we've seen the process of them digging the hole in the ground. And all that dirt work is done. And then they came in and they, they started kind of plotting and getting ready to pour the foundation. And then they got the foundation poured. And it, this is, it seemed like a long process. Uh, and finally, that, once that foundation was set, they began to put up this duplex. Now, why did they take so long with that foundation? Why couldn't they just take a day, kind of just throw something together? Why? Because if they did, that building would be unsound. It would be a problem. It would lean. It would have all kinds of problems because the foundation is important. So what is the foundation for serving? Why do we serve? Why do we serve? We see the answer here in the first verse of Romans 12. Take a look at the text. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Paul is the human author of Romans. Now, we're not going to dig into all the, the background information on this, but Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and we can see here, he's not just giving some advice, as in, you know, I, I took, uh, here's something for the suggestion box here. here here's something that, that you should think about, maybe. Uh, just consider this. That's not the tone of Paul's language here. If you're reading the NIV, it says, I urge you. There is an authority behind this appeal. Paul is appealing with authority from God himself. And the appeal, the urging, is based on something. Did you catch what it is in verse 1? What is the appeal based on? It starts with the letter M. The mercies of God. Now, what is mercy? We're going to take a long time. This is going to be really the majority of this message is going to be talking about this. Because this is the foundation. That's why we're taking the most time to talk about this, why we serve, the answer is God's mercy, God's mercy. So what is mercy? Let's define it. I like to define it this way. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. It's not getting what we deserve. Now, we think about grace and mercy. They're not the same. Grace is a gift. Grace is something that we receive that we don't deserve. So grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So mercy is not getting what we deserve. Now, Paul is referring back to the previous chapters of Romans. We're not going to read all those chapters, but Romans chapter 9, verse 16 says this, salvation does not depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. In Romans 9, verse 23, believers are called objects of God's mercy prepared for God's glory. In Romans chapter 11, verses 30 through 32, we see God is making a new people for himself. Gentiles, non-Jews, are brought in by God's mercy. Jews will be brought back to God by his mercy. We see that word over and over again in those verses. God's mercy, God's mercy, God's mercy. See, God's mercy is clear to all of us. See, we're not getting what we deserve. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we will say, what I deserve is not salvation. I deserve punishment because I'm a sinner. I was born into sin and I chose to rebel against God. And so because all of us have sinned, 
We deserve eternal death, eternal separation from God, but God does not give us what we deserve. Praise God for that. So this is the foundation for serving. It's one word, mercy, mercy. Now Jesus told a parable in Matthew 18. Maybe you know this parable. It was about a servant who owed a debt he could never pay. Never. You know what he owed his master? He owed his master 200,000 years of wages. That's not an exaggeration. That's the math. He owed his master 200,000 years of wages. If we took, um, uh, if you figure in today's money, today's wages, if you make $50,000 a year, 200,000 years of wages amounts to $10 billion with a B. That's what this servant owed his master, $10 billion. Now, the begs the question, how in the world did he rack up that kind of debt? What was he doing, right? But let's not think about that. Let's just consider, this is, this is a debt he could never pay. If he lived <laughs> thousands of lifetimes, he could never pay this debt. So it was an unpayable debt. There was no way he could pay this debt. So what did he do? He did the only thing he could do. He fell on his knees and begged for what? Mercy. mercy. He needed mercy. He needed to not get what he deserved. He groveled. He pled with this master. And the master, out of pity for him, did the unthinkable. He forgave the debt. He forgave it. This massive impossible debt wiped out, gone. That is unbelievable mercy. You would think that this servant would be the most grateful, the most merciful person in the world in that moment. But as soon as he left his master's presence, he found a buddy who owed him one day's wage. And he grabbed him by the neck, grabbed him by the collar. And he said, hey, pay me what you owe me. And the, and, the, and the fellow servant says, well, I'm sorry, just give me some more time. Please give me mercy. And this servant said, okay. No, that's not what he said. He said, I've been shown great mercy. Of course, I'll give you mercy. Yes, I have mercy to hand out like popsicles. No, he didn't, he didn't give him mercy. Instead, what did he do? He took this friend, this buddy, fellow servant, and he threw him in jail until he could pay the debt. This one, this tiny debt. He couldn't forgive that tiny debt. Now, of course, word came back to this servant's master that what had happened, and uh, he called the servant to himself, and he said, and we see this in Matthew 18, this is the master speaking to the servant. He says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not, or should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? We too have been shown great mercy. We had a debt that we could never, ever pay. It was more than 200,000 years of wages. It is an eternal debt. We could live an eternity of lifetimes and never pay it off. And do you know what God did? Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, but God, being rich in what? Mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So God made us alive with Christ. So my question to you this morning is simple. Are you alive? Are you alive with Christ? If you do not have Jesus, you are still dead in your sins. You are still dead. You still owe that eternal debt that you can never pay. But the good news, the gospel, is that Christ came to die for sinners like you, like me. He came to die for us. He paid the debt in full, the debt we could never pay. Jesus paid it all. 1 Timothy 1.15 tells us this saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ came, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So has your impossible debt been paid once and for all. Do you have new life in Christ? If you don't, you can turn to him now in your heart. You believe on what he has done. See, God has done everything necessary to wipe 
away your eternal debt. He, he wiped it off the books on the cross. But you have to receive this. You have to believe on Christ and receive this forgiveness, this mercy. In fact, it's more than that. We're, we're more than just forgiven our sins. We're more, the debt is more than just wiped away. In fact, we receive an eternal inheritance in Christ because we're adopted into God's family as his children forever. And nothing can take that away from us. So this is an incredible gift. God's mercy and God's grace is given to us in Christ, but we have to act upon this good news. We have to make a decision, make a response. Have you responded to the gospel? Have you responded to this good news? Has your debt been paid? You, you might be asking, well, what do I need to do to receive this mercy, this forgiveness? You need to repent of your sin. You need to believe on Christ alone for your salvation. Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That's repenting. It's turning to him. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that? Have you repented of your sin and believed on Christ? I hope you have. I know many of you have. I hope if, if you're listening to this message and you've never repented of your sin, you've never believed on Christ, it's a decision of the heart. You can make it right now. Right where you're sitting, you can make this decision to receive God's mercy, God's grace, and forgiveness in Christ. Now, many of us in this room, most of us, I would say, are believers in Christ. We have made this decision. We've turned to Jesus. So here's the question for us. Does your life reflect mercy? Does our life reflect the mercy God's given to us? See, in this parable, this wicked servant had received this incredible, unbelievable mercy, and yet his life was unchanged. He acted as if it never happened by grabbing that fellow servant and demanding that he pay the debt. So I was thinking about this this week. In fact, I was uh, with my youngest. I was with Claire, and I was, we were laying in bed together, and it was the night she was going to, to sleep, and I was just laying there with her, and I was, I was thinking, this question just, just bothered me. I was thinking, how is that possible? I was thinking about this wicked servant, and I'm thinking, how is it even possible to receive that kind of forgiveness, that kind of mercy, and to turn around and live as if it never happened? How's that possible? It bothered me. And so I was thinking about this, and I'm praying about it. I'm saying, God, how is that possible? And is that true? Does that still happen today where people like us, churchgoers, Christians can be shown incredible, eternal mercy and live like nothing has happened. How is that possible? And why is it that Paul is writing to this church in Rome and has to plead with them to do something about the mercy of God? Why does he have to plead with them? Shouldn't it come naturally? What, what causes this? What causes this apathy, this living as if we've never received God's mercy when we have? What's the problem? I came up with three possibilities, and we need to take these seriously. Three possibilities, three possible reasons uh, why this could happen. Number one, ignorance. Ignorance. Now, what I mean by this is we don't realize how desperately sinful we were. We're ignorant of how, in how, what, what deep trouble we were in because of our sin. We're ignorant to it. We do not know the immensity of the debt that we owed. We're ignorant to it. We, we walked an aisle, we prayed a prayer, uh, we believed on Jesus, we got, my, we got our fire insurance card from hell, and now we can go live how we want. That's ignorance. That is not understanding the mercies of God. See, the danger is, if that's your story, if, if you, you just are living in ignorance, the danger is that you may think you're a Christian and you're actually not. You know what's possible? That you may think you're saved and you're not? I don't want that to be true of you. But this is what Jesus says in Matthew 7. He says, on that day, judgment day, many, see, not just a few. What does he say? On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He says, I never knew you. 
Jesus wrote a letter to a church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. Listen to what he says to the church. He says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. So this church in Sardis was walking in a certain way and talking in another way. See, their, their, their walk didn't match their talk. They appeared alive, but what does Jesus say? You're dead. You're actually dead. What do we do? If we're living in ignorance, if we are, if this is us, if we're, our lives are remaining unchanged because of the mercies of God and we're, we're living in ignorance, what should we do? Here's the solution. We need to realize and repent. We need to realize and repent. Are you ignorant today? Turn to Jesus and repent. Realize afresh the depths of God's mercy to you. That is, the, that is the step we need to take. If we're living in ignorance, we need to realize and repent. Here's the second possible reason we could live unchanged as a result of God's mercy. Complacency. Complacency. We've been Christians a long time. For such a long time, we've forgotten our once desperate state. We are, this is a possibility too, we are theologically sound and practically complacent. We believe certain things, but we don't live like we believe them. We're complacent. We're merciless. Now, this was the problem for the church at Ephesus. Jesus writes to the church in Revelation 2 saying, you have abandoned the love that you had at first. In fact, he says this uh, in verse 5 of Revelation 2. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. This is a call to all complacent Christians. Remember where you, from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. This is a complacent church. Here's the question. Am I, am I complacent? Is that me? Am I complacent? Here's the solution. I need to repent and re-engage. I need to repent and re-engage in the work of the ministry and church life. This will shake me out of complacency. This is repentance and re-engagement. Third, here's a third possibility, arrogance. Arrogance. We have such a high view of ourselves we think God is just glad to have us on his team. I'm so glad that God, I mean, God must be so excited to have me on his team because I've got, I've got money, I've got resources, I've got talents. Um, I'm such an asset to God. That's arrogance. This, there's another church that Jesus wrote a letter to in Revelation chapter 3. is the church at Laodicea. He calls them lukewarm. Now, if you study this a little closer, uh, this has to do with the water supply in Laodicea. Uh, Jesus isn't saying, I wish you were, um, I, I w Jesus isn't saying, I don't want you cold. He's saying cold water has value, it's good. Hot water has value, it's good. Lukewarm ha water has no value at all. You're, you're, you have no value. Uh, and Jesus is sick to his stomach because of this church. He wants to vomit Listen to what he says to the church at Laodicea. He says, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Ouch. Jesus is speaking to this church at Laodicea. See, Laodicea was very wealthy. They had all they needed. They were self-sufficient, self -sufficient, and their self-sufficiency led them to arrogance. So here's the question, am I arrogant? And I think this is where I land of the three, of the three things that keep me from being merciful, this is where I, this is where I am. I land in arrogance. Here's the solution, I need to repent and respond to Jesus. Repent and respond to Jesus. Are you arrogant? Repent and respond to Jesus. You know what Jesus says in Revelation 3? You know this verse. You've heard it at evangelistic crusades. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. You know who G Jesus is talking to? He's not talking to unbelievers. He's actually talking to believers. He's talking to the church. He's saying, wake up. 
you're so arrogant, you're not even letting me in the building of your life, of your church. Jesus is knocking at the door. He's asking to come in. The Lord is standing outside the door. He's been expelled from this church, these people's lives. He wants to come back in. He wants to have fellowship with them. So if I'm arrogant, I need to let Jesus back in, and I need to let him have full control of my life. That takes a humbling of myself and saying, I can't do this myself. I can't do this on my own. I am not self-sufficient. I need Jesus, and I need him to take over once again. So if you're arrogant, if you're stuck in arrogance, repent and respond to Jesus. So when we think about the depths of God's mercy to us in Christ, it prevents ignorance, it destroys complacency, and it cuts down arrogance at the root. Today, as we go to these different sites where we're serving, may we go thinking about the mercies of God. This week, as we go to school, as we go to work, to family life, may we be fixed on this idea of the mercies of God and think about how great his mercy is to us. See, God's mercy should change our everyday lives. It should. So God's mercy is why we serve. Second, second, let's consider how we serve. How we serve. How do we serve? What do we do? According to these verses, we can serve in two specific ways, two ways to serve. First, with our bodies. We can serve with our bodies. Look at the second part of verse 1. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Now, this is a loaded statement. Just stop there for a moment. This is a loaded statement. So picture this. Sacrifices were made to God in the Old Testament. They took animals and they slaughtered them. It was a bloody affair. And they sacrificed these animals on altars to satisfy the wrath of a holy God. See, someone has to die for sin. Someone has to pay the penalty. And so these lambs, these goats, these bulls were slaughtered and placed on the altar as a service to God, as a way to worship him. But now, what has happened? Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God, who what? Takes away the sins of the world. In fact, in Hebrews, we see he died once for all. No more lambs, no more goats, no more bulls, no more sacrifices need to be made. Wait a minute, except, except here we see in Romans 12, as a follow-up, Jesus has died for our sins. We're made right with God once and for all. But now, we crawl up on the altar. We get up there. And we say, God, my life is yours. We sang it this morning. Here am I, all of me. Take my life. It's all for thee. So we, we're saying, I'm going to offer my body as a living sacrifice. Not, not a dead sacrifice. Not one that's going to be slain, but one that will live for Christ. And I'll use my body to glorify him. So we use our gifts we use our talents, our time, our money, our lives, everything. All that we have can be an act of worship physically. So look at the end of verse 1. This is actually worship. Look at the end of verse 1. Which is your spiritual worship? So when we go, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. We are worshiping Him. We're glorifying Him. So when we, if you're involved today in Church has left the building. When you go to different sites, when you're serving, when you're cleaning up garbage, when you're picking up, when you're spending time with people and serving them with your body, you're worshiping God. You may not be singing, but you're worshiping God with your body. You're offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Now, if you're not participating today, this applies to the workplace. It applies to school and home. Wherever you go, whatever you do physically with your body, you can worship God and serve him in view of his mercy. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Don't like your job? Can't stand your boss? Don't respect your teacher? Work hard anyway. Because as you consider God's mercy, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. You're not ultimately serving them. You're serving the Lord Christ. How do we serve? First, with our bodies. Second, with our minds. With our minds. This is how we serve. Look at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do I serve with my mind? The text actually gives us three ways, and this is how we'll close. Three ways to serve with our mind. First, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. So to be conformed is to do what everyone else is doing, to say what everyone else is saying, to allow the world to shape the thoughts and actions that we do. Now, let's just be honest, it's easy to conform. It's easy to conform, to be conformed. It's hard to not be conformed. It's hard to not be conformed. See, as followers of Christ, when we have been shown great mercy, we are living sacrifices. Emphasize on sacrifice. Um, If we are, and if we are, if we're living sacrifices, then we sacrifice the easy road. The easy road is conformity. We sacrifice that. We lay it down. We say, uh, when when, uh, we say no, when the culture says yes. We lay down our rights rather than demanding them. We hold everything with an open hand rather than saying mine. Do not be conformed. So it's the first way we serve with our mind. Second, be transformed. Be transformed. How? Maybe you caught it. How are we transformed? By the renewing of our mind. Not the renewing of our emotions or even of our will. The transformation here happens uh, in the mind, in the way we think, in our mindset. So what we think matters. What we believe matters. Uh, The word Paul uses for transform is the same word Mark uses when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he totally changed before the disciples' eyes. It is a total change. A transformed mind or a renewed mind is totally different than a worldly mind. We change the way we think, and when we do, it'll change the way we live. So when we change the way we think, we'll change the way we live. So don't be conformed, be transformed. Third, discern God's will. Now, the order matters. So as we're not being conformed to the pattern of this world, and as our mind is being transformed, renewed, then we'll be able to do this third thing, which is to discern God's will. See, God's will is described in three ways. Did you catch the three in the text? What does it say? He is good. It's good. It's acceptable, or NIV says pleasing and perfect. God's will is that and more. So here's the question. How do we discern God's will? What are some practical ways we can do that? If you were here last week, you heard this, and I'm going to just repeat the three application points um, from Colossians 1. How do we discern God's will? Through God's word, which we handed out this morning to second graders. That was so cool. We discern God's will through God's word, God's spirit, and God's people. That's how we discern God's will. See, God's word will help us renew our mind. God's spirit will lead us into truth, helping renew our minds. And God's people will come alongside us and help us not conform to the world and hold us accountable. See, when we get into small groups, when we have Bible studies, when we spend time together on Sunday morning, we should be encouraging one another, exhorting one another, holding one another accountable so that we will not be conformed to the patterns of this world. We will live differently. So, Are we in God's word? Are we submitted to God's spirit? Are we spending time with God's people? If we we increase our commitment to these three, we will better discern God's will and we will be able to serve him well with our minds. So how do we serve? We serve God with our bodies and with our minds. And then when someone may come up to you today and ask you, why are you doing this? You can say, here's why I serve. Because God has shown incredibly, eternally glorious mercy to me. This mercy compels us to go and be the church today and every day. Let's pray. Let's ask God for his help, okay? So let's pray right now. God, we thank you so much for this time in your word. And Lord, we commit ourselves to the work that you have for us today. Wherever we go, whatever we do, this whole week, even not just today, but all week long, we pray that you would help us to serve compelled by your mercy that you've shown to us in Christ. And so we commit ourselves to that uh, for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.